Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we uh, talk about the Lamb of God this morning and our worship that's going to be the focus because that is in the gospel lesson what John calls out as he is about to baptize the Savior. He says, and you know these words, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's an idea that even though it was so common, should have been common to the Old Testament believer and to us as well, it gets lost sometimes. It gets lost because we have this idea that we are somehow paying for sins as we go. And the fact is, we don't. We have a substitute who stands in our place, and that substitute is the Savior. It's Jesus, who is that lamb. And that substitutionary idea means he has done all the work, and he has called us to believe. And so let that uh, truth shine in our worship today and always in our lives as Christian believers. Uh, our first hymn this morning, Appropriately Lamb of God. God bless you, Lord.
Christ. O Lord, open my lips. And my heart shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Come, come, let us worship. from the womb to be his servant to turn Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him so that I will be honored in the eyes of the Lord because my God has been my strength the Lord said it is too small a thing that you should just be my servant to raise up only the tribes of Jacob and to restore the ones I have preserved in Israel so I will appoint you to be a light for the nations so that my salvation will be known to the end of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning we'll sing is I waited, waited for the Lord, from uh, based on Psalm 40.
in our second lesson from Colossians chapter 2, the Lamb of God needed to be flesh and blood so that he could be sacrificed. And because that Lamb was the Son of God, it is a sacrifice valuable enough to forgive all of us our sins. Here Paul writes, And therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. Being, uh, by being rooted and built up in him and strengthened in the faith just as you were taught while you overflow in faith with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceits, which are in accord with human tradition, namely the basic principles of the world, but not in accord with Christ. For all the fullness of God's being dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been brought to fullness in him. Christ is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done by human hands. In the putting off of the body of flesh and the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with Christ in baptism. And in baptism you were also raised with him through the faith, worked by the God who raised Christ from the dead. The word of the Lord. Let us rise for the gospel lesson. John chapter 1 is the last and greatest of the prophets. John the Baptist succinctly summarizes God's plan for salvation by pointing to Jesus and calling him the Lamb of God. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, the one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. I myself did not know who he was, but I came baptizing with water so that he would be revealed to Israel. John also testified, I saw the Spirit descend, uh, descend like a dove from heaven and remain on him. I myself did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain he is the one who will baptize with the holy spirit i saw this myself and have testified that this is the son of god the next day john was standing there again with two of his disciples when john saw jesus passing by he said look the lamb of god the two disciples heard him say this and they followed jesus when jesus turned around and saw them following him he asked, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He told them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother Simon and say to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. We'll sing our next hymn, Arise and Shine in the Splendor. But still be seated.
Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Amen. Fellow believers, uh, do you like solving riddles? Some riddles are, are pretty easy, like uh, what's black and white and red all over? That'd be an easy one, right? We all heard that in elementary school. But others can be a little harder. How about this one? I have two arms, but fingers none. I have two feet, but cannot run. I carry well, but I have found I carry best with my feet off the ground. What do you think? I'm a wheelbarrow. So, I have two arms, the handles. I have two feet, the two little legs, but I can't run. I carry well, best with my feet off the ground. And Riddles are a little difficult, or they can be, because they're always using some kind of figurative language. And until you know the secret, uh, it can be hard to figure out. You might not get it. But once the riddle is solved, once it's unlocked, it all becomes clear. So why are we talking about riddles in church? Well, this morning, the word of God might seem a little puzzling, might seem sort of like a riddle with some of the language. Uh, listen to some of the clues that Isaiah gives. The Lord called me from the womb. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He concealed me in his quiver. I have labored in vain, yet a just verdict for me rests with the Lord. I picked and chose some tough pieces from that Isaiah 49 reading. Who's he talking about? It seems like a riddle that's begging to be solved. Well, this morning, we are going to let God solve the riddle for us. God never intended his word to be such a mystery for us. He wants us to take uh, the whole of Scripture and make good use of it in helping to understand maybe the parts of Scripture that seem a little more complicated, a little less obvious. And so let's do that. Today we turn our attention to someone described as the servant of the Lord in the text, and we're going to focus especially on the unusual characteristics of the servant of the Lord. And we'll see that he was called before birth, that he had a mouth like a sword, that he labored to no purpose, and restored the tribes of Jacob. And I don't want to leave you suspense the entire ser uh, sermon. The servant of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus. So first, the servant of the Lord says about himself, the Lord called me from the womb when I was inside my mother. He mentioned my name. And that's a clear reference to the fact that long before God's sin actually took on uh, sin, the Son actually took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary, God had already spoken to him. God spoke about this one, the servant of the Lord, in a veiled way, albeit all the way back in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, our first parents. Uh, God promised that one was coming. Uh, thousands of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God was already talking about the Savior. And long before Jesus was actually born, God had already made mention of his actual name. Remember that God told Mary and Joseph uh, before the birth, you are to give the child the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's what the name Jesus means, uh, Savior. In verse 2, we get to the second point. He says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. Sword, And this isn't really that much different. If you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, there's a verse that you'll probably say, I've heard that before. For the word of, of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the point of dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, even being able to judge 
the ideas and thoughts of the heart. And you might say, well, okay, he uses the word sword in there, but how is that linking together? A mouth like a sharpened sword. Well, the word of God is like a sword. The word of God, you think of how many times that with his words, Jesus was able, and still is, by the way, able to cut right to a person's heart. What did he, what did he say to the Pharisees? When they needed to be cut to the heart and caught up short by what Jesus had to say to them. Woe to you experts in the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs that appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead people's bones and every kind of uncleanness. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Or think about Jesus' words when he's speaking one time to the disciples. How will you tell your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, when in fact you have a beam in your own eye? And those words meant for the disciples, haven't they at one time or another pierced your heart too? Um, or his words to the woman who was living with a man outside of marriage, and Jesus, go call your husband, and she doesn't have a husband. All words like those from the mouth of Jesus cut to the heart of his listeners. Jesus' words convicted them of sin, uh, sin, and yet Jesus' words not only convict, not only convict human hearts with the law, but they comfort human hearts. Repentant human heart with the gospel. You, you think of his words to the paralyzed man. Son, your sins are forgiven. Right? Not just the paralyzed parts of your body, but your sins are forgiven. Or to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Or to the disciples, peace I, I, I leave with you. My peace I give you. And the same thing is still true today. Jesus' words still cut us to the heart. His word exposes our inner feelings. It exposes what we lack. Uh, our lack of trust in him, our unwillingness to let him be the number one uh, in our lives, our natural selfishness, our desire to put on a good front before God without actually letting him into our hearts. I mean, the audacity of, of, of who and what we are sometimes, that we think we can get away with that, that we try. And even though all that's true, and it is, I know it's not just me. Even though all that's true, we still have a God, a Savior, who says to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And where does that rest come from? It comes from the forgiveness that Jesus has freely granted us. He says, I am. Yes, he's the Lamb of God. And in another place, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep as they listen to my voice. I lay down my life for the sheep. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. If you think about it, the very words that Jesus spoke uh, during his earthly ministry over 2,000 years ago, they still apply to you and me today and tomorrow and every day of your life that you apply those wonderful words that he wrote to you in your life. The words of his mouth are like a sharpened sword. Did you realize as well that Jesus was at times frustrated with his work? Just like you and I get frustrated with our work. He said, I have labored in vain. I spent my strength. I came up empty with nothing. And with these words, Jesus isn't saying to us that the work he did as your Savior came to nothing. <clears throat> or that redeeming mankind 
from sin was a failure altogether, a waste of his time, but rather he's admitting or referring to the day-to-day the -day work that he carried out during those three years of his earthly ministry in the, in the land of Judea. And you think about it. During the first year of his public ministry, people were just getting to know about him. He wasn't that popular. During his second year of ministry, he becomes wildly popular. Uh, the gospel accounts are full during this time of examples where he would go without sleep, instead choosing to be with the people that needed to be seen, to be hearing him. He would go without food. He would go off and pray on his own. And um, so much so that at a time when a storm rages about him on the open waters of the, of the Sea of Galilee, what's he doing? Sleeping in the back of the boat. Right? People be, uh, came great distances to hear and see him. By the third year, the crowds are departing. Departing. John writes, um, from this time many of his <coughs> disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They uh, decided his teachings were, were not, uh, not for them. And it is recorded for us how he wept over Jerusalem. And those are the times he well could have said, I have labored in vain. And you know what that feels like. We have a glimpse of the, uh, of the depths of Christ's humiliation. And we talk about this in, in Bible class sometimes, his, his humiliation, how far he left heaven behind to come to this world and to be our Savior, to stand in our place. And then, of course, later we talk about his exaltation. Uh, uh, but right now, his humiliation. And remember that this is the, the true God undergoing absolute rejection by a world full of sinners. And that's just a part of the degradation that Jesus undergoes on our behalf. But it also means that Jesus knows the hurt of every Christian parent who spends years raising a child and putting all the best into them. And in spite of encouragement and education, that child, him or her, runs away and, and into a life of sin. Sometimes for a time, <coughs> a season. Jesus knows how it feels when an unchurched person that you've been working with for some time spurns your invitation to come and learn more about the God who wants to tell them he loves them unconditionally. And it's a message you just can't get shared. Jesus knows what it's like to put in long hours at work or at home and feel like at the end of those long hours that you don't have anything to show, anything to show for. Jesus knows what it feels like when you've labored in vain. And yet, how did Jesus deal with those apparent failures? Listen to the attitude uh, that he expresses in verse 4. Yet a just verdict for me rests with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. In other words, Jesus says, I'll trust that the Heavenly Father, he has a plan for me. And I'm going to focus on being faithful to his will, and I'm going to leave the final results to him. So be faithful with what is your responsibility and let God be faithful with what is his responsibility when you're on good ground. Point four. The last characteristic that the servant of the Lord is is that he would restore the tribes of Jacob and that's not a reference to Jesus' uh, founding of the state of Israel as a, as a country in 1948, or the fact that he is going to restore uh, Israel to a place of prominence on the world stage. 
He's talking about raising up the Jews spiritually. He's talking about calling them back to faith in the one true God. And even, even though there were a lot of Jews who stubbornly clung to their own misguided attempts to keep the law in the Old Testament, that that was what was going to make them right with God, there were also a lot of Jews who realized that they weren't able to keep the law, who realized that they needed someone else a savior to keep the law for them, to take away and to deal with their sin and their guilt. They needed a savior like the one that God promised the people of God in the Old Testament. A savior like the one John the Baptist pointed to when he said, look, the Lamb of God he is, uh, who takes away the sin of the world. By the grace of God, there were a lot of Jews there were a lot of Jews in Jesus' day who looked at Jesus and said, that's him. He's the one. He's the Savior. He's my Savior. Eleven disciples did. Paul did. The thief on the cross did. Hundreds of thousands of people who were Jewish by blood ultimately became Christian by belief. And that miracle of God uh, gathering to himself people of Jewish descent, it has not stopped to this very day. Jews are still coming to faith. And yet, God wasn't content to have his servant Jesus just gather Jews to himself. He said it is too small a thing that you should just be my servant to raise up only the tribes of Jacob and to restore uh, the ones I have preserved in Israel. So I will appoint you to be a light for the nations so that my salvation will be known to the ends of the earth. The end of the earth. Way back in the Old Testament, God was saying, way back in Isaiah, right? 700 years before the time that Jesus was born. God was saying, the Savior I will send is going to be for the Jews. It's going to be for everyone. Everybody is going to know that they have a Savior. Isn't it remarkable how much God revealed about his servant and this Savior hundreds of years before it actually happened that Jesus was born? Um, how much we can learn about Jesus in the New Testament is wonderful. But there's a lot that we can learn from the Old Testament as well. Uh, before he was ever revealed and wrapped in strips of cloth and laid down in a manger. And if you think about it, it underscores the fact that this whole book of God's word, from the very first pages of Genesis to the last pages of Revelation, have entirely to do with one individual. It is the story of Jesus and the salvation um, that he brings to the world, promised and delivered from beginning to end. The whole book is about Jesus, the one who knows exactly what we're going through, the one whose word
be seated. We ask our ushers to come forward as we gather our gifts for the Lord's work. <clears throat> This time we'll continue with our next hymn, uh, All Who Believe and Are Baptized. struggle with illness. We remember today, especially Christine Fleck, relieve her pain and restore her to health. Give her the patience to bear up under uh, these hardships with the faith that looks to you for needed strength. Almighty God, you gave your one and your only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you brought us safely to this new day. 
Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise to God. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. Amen. The Lord grant you peace all your days. Amen. We'll remain standing as we sing our closing hymn in Christ alone. again online and in person. It's good to have you here on this second Sunday after Epiphany as we're celebrating it. A couple of announcements uh, in two weeks. Uh, the 29th, wait a minute, that's next Sunday. Yeah. One week from now, one week from this very day, we will have a quarterly meeting after the worship service, so that's next Sunday. After that, we'll have a fellowship dinner, part of our fifth Sunday uh, plan to have fellowship meals, and this is our first one for 
2023. It's so nice to say when I got it. Yeah. And then um, on Sunday, February 5th, we're going to be starting Sunday morning Bible class again. We're going to undertake a study of the book of Genesis. And uh, it's been, I started it a few weeks ago on Thursday morning. And I, it's been a rich study. So we'll see. You're starting in about a month later. So we'll see uh, if you can catch up and pass the Thursday morning. <laughs> I would say the chance is good. <laughs> All right. And uh, I think that's everything. Uh, there is a, oh, Tuesday morning, a meeting of the Altar Guild, or Altar Care Committee, I'm not sure what it's called, but 10 o'clock uh, for those who are planning on being there for that. 